Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. My name's Aaron, and today I have something I think is pretty special. It's this wood grain PC, the North Star Horizon. Now, maybe some of you who are into retro and vintage computers have uh, are fans of LGR, and uh, you know over there that he has a wood grain 486. Oh yeah, I think I've got myself a uh, wood grain PC case here. <laughs> where he just took some wood grain uh, laminate basically and put it on the outside of a 486 computer. Well, this is not that. This is actually the real deal. One of the only computers that I know that was ever sold on purpose with a wooden case. This is real wood, not the fake stuff. This is the original wood grain personal computer. There were other computers sold, for example, the Apple One, where people built wooden cases for the computer, but it wasn't sold that way. It wasn't manufactured that way. This was actually manufactured, purpose-built, with a wooden case. So we're gonna take a look at this today, and we're also gonna take a look at the interesting history and how it coincides with a certain fast food chain. That's coming up right now on the Retro Hack Shack. Okay, so in order to get a sense of the what was going on at the time that this computer was released and out in the market, uh, I thought I would turn to a couple of Byte magazines. By the way, Byte magazines of this era had the best covers. Uh, this one's got kind of a maze, like a computer-generated maze thing going on with the sun and the moon, a little pendulum. This is done by Bruce Holloway. And then this one over here was done by Robert Tinney, and it's got like, a, I don't know, like a a bunch of buoys. I don't know if this is a, a, another type of maze, a sea maze or game or something. Really cool covers. Anyway, let's start with this one from November of 1977. So if you know anything about the history, especially of the personal computer, you'll know that uh, 1977 was when the uh, trifecta of computers hit the market. The Commodore PET, the Apple II, and the TRS-80 Model 1. In fact, if we look at the back of this magazine right away, we can see an ad for the TRS-80 Model 1 here, the first complete low-cost microcomputer system for business, home, or education. Uh, so Radio Shack was just starting to really advertise at this point in time. However, when we open this thing up, you can see that it's very much still the days of the uh, Altair. This would have been just after the Altair was really popular. So a lot of the second generation of S100 bus machines um, were, were really big in the marketplace at that time. So you can see over here, here's a SWTP or Southwest Technology Products machine, S100 uh, compatible machine uh, here that they're selling as a kit. And over here you can see there's a Chromemco which also made S100 machines. And uh, so these would have been uh, really popular at the time. This is what people were uh, getting into. This was kind of like the high point of these particular types of machines. And the personal computer was just starting out. Of course, MSI was really popular at this time. Again, another, not a, necessarily a clone, but uh, certainly a, a follow-on from the Altair uh, 8800. And uh, this is an ad for, for MSI. Look at this huge, terminal with a built-in, looks like a maybe an eight inch floppy disk drive there. It's almost as big as her half of her body. Look at this printer, look how big that is. So yeah, MSI was uh, definitely in the market as well still at this point. And here's another really popular system for the time. In fact, my friend Jim has his still um, that he bought somewhere around this time. It's the Soul Computer from Processor Technologies, the sole terminal computer. What was different about this one was it had didn't require a terminal to be connected to it. It had a keyboard built in and it had video outputs. You could connect a TV, very similar to the Apple One or the Apple Two. It had uh, it was kind of a, uh, somewhere in between actually, even though it was an S100 based system um, uh, from the outside, it was somewhere in between the Apple Two and the other uh, uh, Altair and Altair clones that were on the market. Um, um, so pretty cool. We'll have to take a look at this system at some point. And of course, there were lots of third parties trying to get into the market at this point. Uh, this one is called the Space Byte Corporation, and they made, um, this one is advertising an 8085 CPU. They call it a self-contained computer. Um, so that's kind of cool. It looks like it really is, too. They've got uh, serial ports built in, parallel ports built in. 8085, Intel 8085 CPU, which they claim is 50% faster than the 8080A. <laughs> 
um, and still compatible with it. They have space for built-in ROMs that you could probably program yourself to make it do whatever you want. And then they have uh, 256 bytes, bytes of RAM included, which isn't much. You probably need an additional memory card, but kind of cool uh, card. I like the uh, I like the name too, Space Byte. And here's a pretty cool article about building a computer from scratch. So they go through, I might actually read this article. This would be cool to try to reproduce uh, perhaps, but it goes through how to build a personal computer. It explains the architecture and what you need. So that's kind of a neat article. It might be fun to reproduce this in the future episode. And here we go. Here's the computer right next to programming quickies. We have the Horizon, the complete computer. So this was an ad from North Star Computers. You can see the, the wood grain case. This is exactly the system we have. Uh, the only difference is, and I'm wondering now if maybe this was an add-on later, is it does not have the power light, which uh, which mine does. It has a little power LED right there. So, And they talk about uh, the Z80 card uh, that they had for performance, the amount of memory, uh, software with the uh, North Star DOS or NS DOS and their own basic here um, and the ability to expand this with uh, um, a second disk drive or I think even a hard drive uh, was available a little bit later on. But here you can see the prices. They sold this as uh, in two different uh, uh, varieties here. One was the uh, Horizon 1, which you could buy for $1,600 as a kit or $1,700 assembled, and the Horizon 2, which you could buy for $2,000 as a kit or uh, $2,350 or so assembled. And in addition to the Z80 card and the memory cards they mention here, it also mentions that they, they sell an 8080 S100 bus. So perhaps you could have some compatibility with things written for the 8080 microprocessor. The other thing I found in this magazine was an ad for Hazeltine or Hazeltine. I still don't know how to say it. Hazeltine 1400 terminal. So um, yeah, probably very similar to the one that I have that goes with this system. So it's kind of cool to see that that was also going on at this time and was uh, highly advertised as something you could buy. And in the back of the magazine, they have this section which is in different colored or different textured paper. This must have been a cost savings measure because um, it's kind of yellowed more over time than the other pages, which are, which are uh, uh, smoother. These are the rougher texture, so they must have been a cost savings measure to put this stuff back here. But anyway, they have this whole section about what's new and they start off by talking about Altair offers mini computer time sharing. So multiple terminals probably connected to an Altair 8800. But if we leaf through this, uh, we will find just over here the North Star new computer, the North Star Horizon. And so this is uh, must have been very early on in the in the life cycle of uh, this particular computer. And it talks about all the things that we mentioned on that ad before. Um, and it says that the uh, the single drive version is the $1,600 one, and uh, the dual drive version is the more expensive one. So that was the difference in those two that we saw before, and it gives the, the address. So very cool, just kind of a, here's what's new, and this is what was new at the time in November of 1977. And way here in the very back of the what's new section, they have an article on the Apple II, and the headline is Apple II, features built-in color compatibility. So they talk about the Apple II. Um, uh, and the interesting thing for me was at the very end of the article, I didn't realize this. And I don't know if this was was actual truth or if this was actually um, something that Apple maybe had planned to do but never did. But it says it comes with two game paddles, which I didn't know. It also says at the very bottom here, it's also available in board only form without the case, keyboard, power supply, or accessories for $600. So I don't know if that if they ever sold any like that as a kit. I'll have to check around and see if you know if this was true when the Apple II came out, if it actually sold as a kit instead of a fully assembled unit. Let me know in the comments below because I've never, never heard that that was the case. I don't know whether this was something they planned and then didn't do or or what but this was certainly early on in the life cycle of the apple II. so pretty cool this whole uh, combination of what was going on in the market you had the s100 machines and you had the uh, personal computers uh, more personal computers i would say apple II and the uh, um, trs80 model one i didn't see an ad in here for the commodore pet but that was probably because pet uh, Commodore didn't advertise too much, as far as I'm aware, in Byte magazine, but certainly a good representation of the systems that were available at the time.
So North Star Computers actually started in June of 1976 selling uh, peripherals for MSI, and they were originally known as Kentucky Fried Computers. Hello to Colonel Sanders and his Kentucky Fried Chicken. Now, I don't know why they were known as Kentucky Fried Computers. Maybe they liked Kentucky Fried Chicken and didn't know any better than to call themselves after a big brand in the marketplace at that time, trying to get some brand uh, recognition or something like that. But I mean, it's not like they were based in Kentucky. They were based in Berkeley, California. So I don't know. But very quickly, they were either sued by Kentucky Fried Chicken or were faced with a lawsuit by Kentucky Fried Chicken and had to change their name to North Star Computers. And they weren't just selling MSI components, but they actually looks like they set up a little mail order business where you could order stuff about from Processor Technology, who built the Soul System, Chromemco, and since I did a whole series on the Apple One, including building my own clone of the Apple One, I'm super excited to see that it looks like they were actually offering mail order for the Apple One. I wonder if anyone bought one this way. Did they just go down to the bite shop and uh, buy an Apple One and put it in a box and mail it to you? I'm really curious about that. But anyway, really neat that they were actually uh, diving deep into this brand new world of personal computing. Okay, so let's take a look at this North Star system with the beautiful wood grain, actual wood case here. And um, the, the wooden part of the case is on three sides. So the top and the two sides here, and then the, bottom, the, uh, the other three sides of the case, including the bottom, um, are aluminum. So we've got aluminum front, aluminum bottom, and aluminum in the back. Um, the You can see there's a uh, LED here, which is the power LED. We've got the North Star logo, which is nice. And then we've got two disk drives, one and two. And this one on this side actually has a North Star branded sticker that says quad capacity drive, quad capacity drive. So uh, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing what that is, is uh, would be 180 times four. So this would be a 720K drive, perhaps. Maybe both of these are, I don't know. Um, I believe they are double-sided, double density drives. So that kind of makes sense if they, they might be seven, 720K drives, but maybe not, maybe not. Maybe they're 360. Oh, this thing is so heavy and we'll find out why when we open it up. Okay, and on the back here, you can see the, the power supply is going to be on this side. That's partly partially why it's so heavy. We've got a nice big fan here, uh, power on and off switch, and this is a momentary switch, a toggle switch. So that would be for reset, most likely. There's a cutout here, which is unpopulated, and even in the user manual, it didn't really specify what this was for, but it's obviously for a connector of some sort. We've got a fuse down here, power input. And then you can see down along the bottom here, there are several ports. These are parallel ports, actually, even though they look like, you know, PC joystick ports. And these are the serial ports, these 25 pin serial ports here. There's two of those. Um, and so you could hook up actually either a serial printer or a parallel port printer to this particular computer. Now you'll also notice that there's cutouts in the back. All of these cutouts along here, there was actually a, a card that you could get, and I don't know how many of these you could stack up in here, but there was a car, at least one card you could get to put in here that would increase the number of serial ports on here so that you could hook up up to eight terminals. So you could have one of these and then eight terminals all connected doing some sort of uh, uh, multitasking with uh, a special version of either DOS or CPM. I can't remember which one, but they actually supported, I believe, up to eight serial terminal connections on this thing. So that's very cool that this was there and you just had the option to add those cards, you know, hook up the, the ports here in the back and away you go. And now it's time to thank the sponsor of this episode, PCBWay. PCBWay offers inexpensive PCB manufacturing and a whole lot more. Need assembly services? No problem. They can do front side, back side, through hole components, you name it. They also offer 3D printing, CNC milling, and more. So check out PCB Way for your next project, and I thank them for their support of the Retro Hack Shack. Okay, now let's take a look at the terminal that I got that I believe went with this. I don't know for sure that it did, but they showed up together. 
uh, at the same time at e-waste. And, uh, uh, I actually asked my friend Jim, uh, you know, when I showed him this, he said, Oh yeah, I bought some of those North Star systems back in the day for my work. And I bought them with Hazeltine or Hazeltine, uh, 1500 terminal. So the same kind of terminal. I don't know if it was the 1500, but same kind of terminal. So I'm assuming if he bought this with, his North Star systems that they go together because probably at that time, you know, you'd buy, you go to North Star, buy the computer and North, you'd say, Hey, North Star, what, uh, terminal should I get? And they probably said Hazeltine or Hazeltine. Um, so they, they probably go together like that. And this is in relatively good shape. I mean, all the keys are here. Uh, they feel pretty good actually to the touch. Um, you know, full QWERTY keyboard here. Numpad over here, which is nice. And then home, clear, uh, break and reset up here at the top. Um, now, um, you'll notice that the, the issue with this, the damage that's going on here is with this, uh, overlay screen that goes in front of the, uh, uh, in front of the, uh, CRT to, pr to, uh, protect against glare and, uh, stuff like that. And so, yeah, this little screen was, was fairly common um, back in the day to put in front of the CRT. So I expect that what's happened here is that this little gasket, and it's still pretty sticky actually, either has corroded. It feels like it's still intact. It doesn't feel like it's disintegrated into goo. So we'll have to see what's going on when we open this up. But basically everything is kind of slid down. The adhesive is, has worn off or melted or become just sticky and not actually tacky enough to hold this in place. Or maybe the CRT itself has become dislodged on the inside so that it's not putting pressure up against the gasket. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm already thinking about how to fix this. Um, I did turn this on. It does come on and give a prompt. So I'm hopeful that we can actually just fix this cosmetic stuff and then it'll just work. That's my, that's my hope. Um, there's a power on indicator here, which is underneath this panel. And if we remove the panel, you can see not only the LED, but also a bunch of dip switch settings in here that um, you can adjust for different things about how the terminal connects to whatever computer it's interfacing with, as well as a contrast knob, um, which I'm hoping will uh, will help if the CR if this particular CRT is dim. Uh, but yeah, there's settings here for the baud rate, for the parity. Um, uh, some video settings here as well. And I don't, uh, don't recognize some of the other settings, but yeah, all of the stuff that you would normally select, like for a, for a modem later on, um, are all right here, BOD, BOD, uh, settings and so forth. So that's really cool that that's built in and that, uh, we'll find out if this is, if I don't have to change anything on here. Although the settings I believe are pretty standard, like 9600 full parity and, um, one, uh, bit setting, I think, but we'll see. Now on the back of the, uh, of the, uh, terminal here, we have the, uh, EIA CL, which I believe is the, the, where you would hook up the terminal connection. And then we have the auxiliary out. Now I don't know if that would be for daisy chaining, perhaps more than one terminal together. Uh, I'm not sure. I'll have to look up and see if I can find a manual for this, but there is an auxiliary out. Um, down here on the bottom, there's a, you know, fairly high serial number. So these were made, you know, uh, with some, uh, um, quite a few of these actually must have hit the market. It says it's rated for 1.2 amps. So yeah, that's pretty good. Over on the left, you can see there's a few more buttons. One is a power switch, the black one there. And then the red one is a reset switch. On the top of the unit, there's quite a number of air vents, and also there's quite a number of vents on the back. So with a linear power supply, most likely in this thing, probably generates a little bit of heat, but these vents take care of that just fine. Now there's not much going on on the bottom, but one thing I did want to point out are these handles that they molded into either side of the bottom of the case. That makes it really easy to carry this, even though it's heavy, CRTs are notoriously heavy to carry, but they built those little handholds into the plastic, making it much easier to carry. Okay, now it's time to crack this thing open and see what's on the inside. And I still haven't found a really good over the head camera shot yet. I will find one uh, soon once I get uh, some other things built out here in the 
retro hack shack out here in the garage uh, with my new sets and everything that I'm working on. But um, for now, uh, this is the front up here by me and the back is kind of towards you up here or towards the bottom of the, the screen, I guess. So this is the back, this is the front. And just take a look at this beautiful wood case. Now, another thing that's different, uh, it's a small thing, but it is a thing. You can tell something's old when it has flat screws instead of Phillips or Torx screws. At least that's one of my standards for trying to figure out how old something is. So I don't know if these were the original screws, but I bet they were, and they use flat screws. So um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a benchmark for me. If it comes with flat screws, it's gotta be old. All right, so with four screws removed, we should be able just to lift this off. And I can tell it has some grooves. So it wants to stay in those tracks and take a look at that. This is the inside of the North Star Horizon. So here are the two drives. I was hoping the drive uh, numbers and models would be up, but they are not. But here's an indication of when this was actually sold. Uh, here it says uh, QCOK7180, so July 1st of 1980 is probably when this system was built. We'll know a little bit more by the chips, but I would say that's a good indicator. Now this could have been added, you know, this could have been an aftermarket drive that was added separately. So it's not a great, uh, perfect indicator, but probably someone that bought this would have bought it with the two drives. And so this was probably manufactured in July of 1980. So back here, we've got a beefy, beefy transformer. This thing is hugely weighted towards this end of the case. When you lift this thing up, this end just wants to go down like this because this transformer, I don't know, must weigh like 10 pounds or something. And check out this capacitor. Oh my word. This thing is like about the size of a coffee cup or actually a little taller, about this, the same uh, diameter, but a little bit taller than a, than a, a big coffee cup. And then we got a couple other uh, green caps down here. Nice big fan. So that's it, linear power supply, no switching power supply here, linear power supply. That voltage is gonna come over here on the board and I can see some regulators here. And then there's gonna be some more, some more regulators here and even more regulators on the cards themselves. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but yeah, this is an S100 system. So you have this S100 bus um, here. So all the add-on cards could, could slot in right here. There's, 12 slots here. So if you think that, uh, you know, old school uh, XT PC had a lot of slots with eight slots, no, this thing has 12 slots. Um, and then of course, there's gonna be some base functionality here, probably for the serial ports and stuff in the, the you know, cause the CPU card is probably gonna be here somewhere. So let's go ahead and pull these cards out and see what we have. Okay, that came out pretty easy. Um, yeah, so this is the, Looks like the main processor board. Yeah, Z80A processor board. Um, yeah, and there's our Z80 right there. I can see it's very small print. Z80 CPU right there. And I'm just looking at some of the date codes on here. And uh, yeah, it looks like these all have 1980 date codes. So this thing was probably, or most definitely manufactured at least in, uh, in 1980. Some of these are 79, uh, but a lot of them are 1980. So that's gotta be when this was from. So this is a, uh, this is the CPU card here. And this is an S100 bus here. It may look familiar. It may look like a, like a, uh, 16-bit ISA bus or ISA bus. In fact, I have another card here that I brought over just to compare. This is a 16-bit, uh, ISA card. And you can see here the, uh, the pin pitch. Hopefully you can see that. The pin pitch on the cards is a little bit different. So it's a little bit wider on the S100 bus card here that of course has a hundred pins. And then the, uh, the, the 16-bit uh, ISA pin pitch is a little bit closer together. And I think this maxed out at something like 98 pins altogether um, with the extended portion here. This card doesn't happen to have any pins down here on the extended portion, but um, the, uh, I think that maxed out at uh, 98 pins. So that's the similarity there between those. And then of course we have the uh, original ISA bus, the 8-bit ISA bus, and you can see how that stacks up, um, how much smaller that is. So, and you gotta remember too that, you know, with this 16-bit ISA bus, there was about 10 years difference in between these uh, uh, standards coming out. The S100 standard started with the Altair, 
Um, in fact, Altair wanted to call it the Altair bus and the other, uh, uh, manufacturers of similar systems, MSI and some other ones at the time. I can't remember who exactly brought it up. This is documented somewhere. Uh, they said, no, 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 we can't call it the Altair bus because that would, you know, shift every, all the marketing in Altair's favor. We need to call it the S100 bus. And so they called it the S100 bus instead. And Altair didn't like that, but uh, that's where the industry went at that point anyway. But anyway, um, so quite ahead of its time with 100 pins here in 1974, I believe, um, is when this uh, first popped up on the market. And then you have the the uh, 16-bit ISA with 98 pins, uh, which was about 10 years later, I believe, around 1984 is when the, the uh, 16-bit ISA card was standard uh, came out. So pretty interesting and, and in a lot of ways ahead of its time, even though, you know, the, the pin pitch is closer on the ISA bus is still, you've got a lot of room for signals and power and IO on this S100 bus. So next up we have a memory card. And if this, uh, if, if my calculations are correct and I had to have some help with this, I believe this is a 32 uh, megabyte uh, memory card. And there's two of these in the system. In fact, let me see if there's a model number somewhere. Uh, North Star Computers RAM 32A1. So yeah, that, that checks out. Uh, 32 uh, meg, <laughs> sorry, 32K, not meg, 32K uh, memory card. And there's two of these in the system. So it's a 64K system, which is a lot of memory for the time. Um, the other thing I'm noticing is that these chips are all kind of popping out of their sockets. And so these are all going to have to be pushed in at some point. Um, I don't know if there's any ASMR fans, but maybe there's some, maybe there's somebody out there that likes pin pushing, uh, pin popping sound. Ooh, that was a good one. Oh yeah. It's like Rice Krispies here. Uh, these things going in. That's what it sounds like a little bit. I'm not seeing too, anything too special necessarily on this particular card because uh, there's a lot of memory and some logic and, the, of course, the regulators I mentioned before. So each of the S100 cards typically came with, in fact, I think they all came with, regulators for whatever voltage they need. So that's why this linear regulator down here would feed up through the bus into these cards and then that would get cut down into whatever, you know, uh voltage you needed, whether it was plus 5, plus 12, or maybe minus 12 at some point. I don't know. Probably not. Uh, but those voltages would have been here. The regulators for those voltages would have been built into right, right into every single uh, card that goes into the system. So now this card here, I'm going to pull it out and take a look. But obviously, this is the floppy controller because it comes over here via this ribbon cable and uh, gets connected. I want to be careful here. OK, there we go. This gets connected over here to the uh, to the floppy drives. And you can take a look at that. Um, in fact, I even think it says under the sticker, I think it says floppy controller. Oh, and it also says over here, tested, uh, tested June 9th. I don't know if you can see that sticker right there. It says tested June 9th, 1980. So definitely a 1980 system. So one thing I'm not seeing on this board is I'm not seeing any uh, f dedicated floppy controller ICs. And so I'm wondering if, um, the, you know, the CPU must be doing that in, you know, in combination with all the logic on this board. The CPU must be the one that's doing, driving the, the floppy drive and uh, managing and controlling the uh, input and output to it, I would guess. I'll look that up and see if I can find any more details, but yeah, I'm not seeing any dedicated uh, uh, floppy controller uh, IC, and that might be just too early. Things were evolving so quickly at this point. I mean, 1980, you know, the, the uh, uh, IBM PC would have been coming out shortly after this, right? Not too long after this. So yeah, a lot of things were changing around this time. Also about the floppy drives themselves, you know, again, this has got to be one of the earliest computers that I know of that had built-in floppies, right? So the PET came out. I'm trying to think. The PET had external floppies. Um yeah, the, the TRS-80 Model 1 had external floppies. I think the certainly the MSI and the uh, um, Altair, I mean, they, they all had external floppies. You could hook up a floppy, but it was external. This has internal floppies. This may be the first 
system with actually internal floppies because this was originally put out on the market in 1977, even though this was made in 1980. This was released in 1977. So for 1977, this may have been the actual first personal computer to have it b- built in floppy drives inside the case. So that's kind of cool. If you, if I'm wrong about that, if there's another one that had this kind of uh, built in floppies for a home user or for a, a personal computer user, at least, let me know in the comments down below. I'm sure there's some examples that must have done this before 1977, but certainly one of the earliest. Now, one other thing you'll notice on these boards is these, uh, they look like ICs, but they have wires going across them. And what I think these are for is uh, addressing. So if you had to address something, you would have to manually uh, hook up connector wires to know what address you wanted to reference. In fact, there's a, there's a prom, there's a missing, you can add a prom to this, uh, which has some different boot up, um, could offer like a boot up program or something like that. And there's one here for the prom address. So it would have to know what address you want to reference from that prom. Um, I'm not an expert in, in this area, but I think that's what those, uh, those kind of like bodge wire looking IC things are. So yeah, very manual process at this point. If you wanted to expand your system, you kind of had to know how things worked in order to correctly address memory and other things to make your system work. And you did that in part uh, by use of these uh, these ICs that basically gave you the opportunity to, to connect and change how the system was addressed. All right, well, I've got to say so far, I don't see any smoking guns. Uh, we've looked at all the cards. We've looked at the history of this great wonderful Kentucky Fried computer. Hello to Colonel Sanders and his Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, this wood grain beauty, and now it's time to turn it on and see if it actually works. But there's some stuff to do before that. Gonna test the power rails, all those kinds of things. So if you wanna see if this will actually fire up and work, you're gonna have to come back in the next episode, which will be part two of this series on the North Star Horizon. Uh, if you like this episode, hit the like button. If you've watched one, two, or three of my episodes and you've come back for a few, please be sure to subscribe. It really does help out the channel. And of course, thanks to all my patrons who will be listed in the credits shortly following this little thing that I'm doing now. So with that, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Patrons receive ad-free and early access to content after the episode commentary, and of course, your name in the credits. If you liked that episode, here's a few more you might enjoy, and I thank you for your support. End of line.